Negotiation tips from Saudis, a final group task, and some reading material if you'd like to deepen your understanding of these topics. And first, I would like to hear from you. It looks like we have a, a very multicultural group out there. And I would like for you just for a second to think back to your very first week in Saudi Arabia, if you're an expat, and if you're a Saudi, if you can think back to the very first time you traveled abroad, lived abroad, or worked with an expat right there at home in your own country. So I'd like you all to get out your phones and go to menti.com and you're going to enter the code. So I'm going to switch screens in just a minute. And what you'll do is you'll enter up to three words or short phrases with your strategies for adapting to a multicultural situation. So just give me one minute while I change the share. All right, give me a thumbs up if you can see this. <clears throat> so you wanna to go to menti.com and enter this code. And once you've entered your different phrases, press submit. Listen, okay, eat good food. <laughs> Great, learning manners, yes. Get out of the bubble, right? Get out there and discover things. Learn the language, learn the customs. Find a friend, yes, very good. Observe, watch, be positive. Fantastic responses, keep them coming. You got homework, yes, do your homework before you go. Fast for Ramadan, okay, try fasting. Read, watch, personal relationships. Adaptive, open mind. Research taboos before, yes. Don't be quick to compare, excellent. Get out of the bubble, yes. Taste the local food, open mind. Glass half full. Wow, I love it. Great responses, everyone. Fantastic. Social media, yes. Pick up a few words. Connect, see, walk, network. These are all fantastic responses. Great. Okay, still coming in, I see. Connect, learn the customs, excellent. No judgments, very good. Respect the local culture. Great, thank you very much everyone for that. That's fantastic. These are all wonderful adaptation strategies. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about developing even deeper adaptation strategies. So give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen again. Yes, thank you, all right. But first of all, what is culture actually? I mean, we all know what culture is, right? It's all around us, but what is it composed of? I mean, we hear this word in many different contexts. We might hear, you know, corporate culture, or organizational culture. We also hear culture as referred to where we come from, but what is it actually? If we were to break it down, what are the elements of culture? So it's a set of beliefs and attitudes and values. And it's the set of behaviors that's shared by a group of people. It's behaviors communicated down through the generations taught by our parents and grandparents. It's socially transmitted ways of behaving. So what they mean by socially transmitted ways, it's like if you're in a country where it's expected to wait in line and then you don't wait in line, then you're gonna have some people looking at you, you know, giving you some dirty looks. So that's how you understand, oh, okay, I'm supposed to stand in the line. It's communicated through, you know, unspoken ways in society. 
So it's the beliefs, the understanding, the ways to interpret experience. And it's all the shared values that distinguish one group from another. So culture is actually much more than where you come from, right? There are so many factors and groups that we belong to throughout our lives, which shape us and shape our value system. So I'm just going to flash a few of them here. I'm sure you can think of many more. These are all the different, you know, influences throughout our lives and the different maybe groups or, or regions we belong to that sort of teach us values and principles that we then inculcate throughout our lives and they become part of who we are. Within cultures, there's also a lot of regional differences. I mean, think about Saudi Arabia and think about all the different dialects, the different cuisines, the different ways of living that exist in this country. And think about how many different things have changed over just the last five years. We can think of culture as a pyramid. The bottom part is what we can say as human nature and universal characteristics. And these are the things that are common to all humankind. You can probably think of many factors such as you know, basic survival needs, um, the need to eat regularly, the desire for shelter, uh, procreation, having families, even if some people decide not to have children, but in general, throughout the whole world, people are having families, right? And then we have the middle section, which is the biggest part, the cultural section, which are the learned behaviors that are specific to different groups or categories that we belong to throughout our lives. And those are the ones we saw on the previous slide and those layer on top of each other. And, it, and then they make up who we are and, and what we believe. And then finally, we have the most important layer, which is the personal part. So we can't forget that everybody is a, is a unique individual with their own individual preferences. So this discussion wouldn't be complete unless we also talked about how many expats are present in Saudi society. So there's a quiz, a little short quiz, one question. What percentage of Saudi society is composed of expats? Does anyone know? If you know the answer, you can either stand up and say it at the microphone if you're feeling brave, or you can put in the chat window, those of you who are here online. It's about 10 million, so a third. You're absolutely right. Thank you. What is your name, sir? My name is Rayan Qarawi. Rayan, thank you so much. You're absolutely right. It's about a third of the society. And that's a pretty big chunk. Thank you so much. You're absolutely right. So cultures are very complex, right? And one of the main things we can work on in order to improve our relationships with other cultures is communication. That's very basic. So two terms I'd like to introduce you to, maybe you've heard of these terms, high context and low context communication. These were terms coined by Edward Hall, who's one of the most famous interculturalists of our time. Let's start with high context. So in high context cultures, people tend to speak indirectly. They avoid conflict. They don't like to say no directly. They prefer verbal communication. They consider it rude to be too direct, especially to people's faces. They don't wanna hurt people's feelings. They always show respect and try to maintain harmony within groups. They value the group membership. They tend to be more collectivist than individualist. They're very relationship oriented and they have strong family values. They easily understand nonverbal clues and visual messages. Time is flexible and in some cases even cyclical. So does this sound familiar? Can you name some examples of cultures with these tendencies? Think about it. All right, so I'm gonna flash some examples up here. Take a look.
Now, the important thing to remember is that these terms are not black and white. There's a lot of gray area. And most of the time countries fall somewhere in between. So it's not like we're saying they're 100% high context or 100% low context, but they tend to fall closer on one end or another. Some countries are in the middle. For example, Italian is here as an asterisk because that one tends to be hybrid. And um, there are other hybrid countries as well. So let's now think about low context. In low context cultures, people tend to speak directly. They say what they mean. They say it like it is. They tend to communicate in structured messages with important details expressed. They tend to be suspicious of people who speak indirectly because they're used to hearing things in a very direct way. So if people are being indirect, they think that they're not being honest or they're hiding the truth or something. They rely on written communication. They prefer written communication when doing business. They're not so adept at reading nonverbal clues. So I always say that it's my high context friends who, when they ask me, how are you, Cheryl? And if I'm not great that day, but I just say, oh, I'm fine, you know, just to, you know, answer the question. It's my high context friends that say, ah, oh, but you're really not that fine. I can see from your face, I can see, you know, something isn't right. Whereas it's my low context friends that if I just say I'm fine, then they say, oh, okay. They accept the answer and move on. So they tend to be more task oriented than relationship oriented. They prefer agendas and schedules. They're the people that are always planning everything out. They like to be organized and, and think of things in advance. They tend to separate work life from family life. So there's a clear distinction between, okay, these are my work hours and these are my free time hours. And there's, there's very little overlap. So now, does this sound familiar? Can you name some examples of cultures with these tendencies? Again, not black and white. There's a lot of gray area. These terms are relative and they're meant to be sort of a guideline and a starting point for us. But of course, as we discussed a minute ago, we have to remember that culture is subjective to every individual's experience. So here's some examples. Maybe you could think of some additional examples. All right. So now let's just try and think for a minute how these cross-cultural conundrums and misunderstandings could possibly happen. Let's think of this high context communicator and let's think of what he could possibly think about low context communicators if they don't understand each other, right? If it's the first time working together. So what do you think the low context would appear to the high context communicator? So I'd like you to take just about two minutes. We have short time, but I would like you to, you know, talk to the people at your table if you're at the Marriott and if you're online, you can, we can just talk kind of openly about this and tell me what you think high context communicators could possibly think about low context communicators if they don't understand each other, if they haven't had cross-cultural training and they don't understand the first time that they're in a, a country or a culture that is the opposite type from theirs, how do you think that could play out? What could they possibly think about low context communicators? So I'm going to give you exactly two minutes and there should be some paper on your table. I would like you to just discuss with your group. You can even draw a bubble like this one on the slide and just give me a couple of points. What could they possibly, you know, how could, you know, cross-cultural miscommunications happen between these two types? So if the people online would like to share their thoughts, they could, you could do so in the chat.
Think about it. What could they possibly think about each other? All right, so we have to consider it from both sides. So we also have to think of what a low context communicator could possibly think about high context communicators if, if they don't understand each other. So remember the low context communicators are those that like to plan everything. They like schedules, punctuality, directness. They like writing everything. They're pretty individualists. They expect you to, to tell them like it is, you know, say exactly what you're thinking. So make a bubble for both and try to imagine how they could possibly have miscommunication or misunderstanding. All right, so time's up. So in the interest of time, we have a very short time today. So I would like to just ask one table to share what they wrote down. If one of the facilitators could kindly choose one table that feels brave and ready and share your thoughts about how these two types could potentially have difficulties working together if they don't understand each other. So what will the high context communicator possibly think or misunderstand or misperceive about the low context communicators? And what might a low context communicator misunderstand or think about high context communicators? Who would like to share? communicator with the high context. So um, he could think that uh, the high context, oh yeah, sorry, I'm not as tall as the previous one. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, he could think that uh, the high context communicator is uh, rude, um, focused on business only because he doesn't want to build a relationship um, he could think that uh, the person, he could have a negative impression of the person uh, because it's a style that he's not used to. Uh, and sometimes also there could be some distrust because again, it's a style that you're not used to. So you're not sure if uh, you, the person is saying what he thinks or not. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, those were great answers. So you can see how people can possibly misunderstand each other. I mean, the high context communicators might think, oh, these low context people are so uh, strict or rigid or, you know, too, you know, too strict, um, too direct, maybe. This is the, the very typical comment that we hear. Whereas, you know, low context communicators might think that high context are maybe not focused or you know they're 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 not professional i mean I, I hear these kinds of comments all the time so the point is to try to change the language we have in our heads so instead of saying like oh these these people are rude you know this sometimes people say words strong words like this that carry some sort of judgment so it's important to speak about cultures in a certain way that's neutral so 
for example, instead of rude, well, we can say that they're just direct communicators. They, they communicate directly. And that kind of language changes the scenario to one that's neutral and non-judgmental. So thank you for the answers, everyone. And now I'd like to introduce you to another model, which I feel helps us to put a lot of cultures into perspective in a very short time and a nice visual model. And it was invented by Richard Lewis, who's basically one of my cross-cultural gurus. And he was a prominent linguist and cultural anthropologist for more than 50 years. Basically, this was his life's passion and his life's work. So he speaks several lang many languages and he lived in many different countries, traveled all around the world and made it his life's work to study cultures and understand them. And as a result of his research and all of his work abroad, he came up with this model of culture. This is the Lewis model. And don't worry, in just a second, I'm gonna show it a little bigger so you can see better. And although he's 88 years old, he'll, he still teaches and trains all over the world. So I would highly recommend if, if you like this topic, um, you know, to go into deeper detail in it, you can read some of his books, which I will give you suggestions at the end of the session for that as well. So Richard Lewis identified three main types of communicators in the world. Now, one of them is multi-active, then we have linear active and reactive. So what do these terms mean? So as the name would suggest, multi-actives are highly active in conversation. They tend to use a lot of gestures. You know, they move their hands a lot. There might be interruptions. Um, the conversation tends to be very colorful and they're not afraid to use emotions. And, and it's a very active conversation, very animated at times. They're very relationship oriented and also family oriented. Then we have linear actives. So these are the ones that like to plan. They're very punctual, they rely on facts and they use logic to back up any of their arguments and they are, they're always looking for logic to, to explain things. They like rules and going by the book. They're pretty methodical. They like processes and, and things like that. They like structure. And reactives are the ones that tend to listen very well to the other person who's speaking and try to establish their feeling and their position. They tend to listen, wait, and pause in, other, in order to give respect and then react to the other person. They tend to be highly respectful. Hierarchy is very important and they're quite comfortable working within a hierarchy. And saving face is essential. So what does saving face mean? Saving face basically means preventing people from embarrassment. So preserving image. These are the three main types. So here's the whole model. Take a look, see if you can find your country. So this model shows the relative placement of countries that are either highly on one side, on one point of the triangle, like when you're active, or highly on another side, like multi-active. But it also shows countries that fall somewhere in between. The countries that have some linear active characteristics and some multi-active characteristics would be the ones along the left side of the triangle. And it's important to remember that these, just like the other terms that we used before, low context and high context, they're meant to be guidelines and a starting point. Um, but the last thing we wanna do is put people in little boxes or create stereotypes and say, okay, all people from this country are, are behaving like this. No, that is not the goal here. The goal here is to give us like an idea for business attitudes, and group behavior. All right, so did you find Saudi Arabia? There it is. Saudi Arabia is very close to being fully multi-active, although there are some reactive characteristics. So let's talk a little bit more about multi-active characteristics. So they tend to be quite talkative and impulsive, very active in conversation. They use a lot of feelings. Relationships are important. 
They may do many things at the same time. They have no problem with multitasking. They tend to have roundabout conversation rather than linear. They speak and listen at the same time and they're very talented at this. They may interrupt frequently, um, and this is not considered rude. Interruption is not considered rude in multi-active cultures, whereas in linear active cultures, interruption is considered impolite. So there's few pauses in conversations, very active, very animated. They might feel confined by agendas, and they might also feel uncomfortable with silence, so they like to fill up the silence. They're very flexible, which is one of the, the things that makes it wonderful to work with multi-actives. Change plans frequently is also a normal thing. It's something that they don't get flustered by. Like if, if things change, then it's, it's perfectly fine and they just go with a the flow. They don't plan in as much detail as linear actives and they're very good at improvising and handling chaotic environments. So just based on this short discussion, I mean, we have a really short time today. So I'm giving you a really quick introduction to these, these types and these models, but what do you think, which one are you? Think about it. So everybody in the world is going to be somewhat of a hybrid. It's very rare that people fall 100% on one type. There is a like an assessment tool you can do with the Lewis company. If anybody's interested, there is a way to figure out which type am I, right? Um, but usually people fall somewhere inside the triangle and they're hybrids. So no matter which type you are, what should we do? I mean, we should be who we are, right? We should be the type that we are, but it's a good idea to adapt to the environment that we're in. So like the old adage says, when in Rome, do as the Romans, right? So I'd like to flash some key characteristics about working with Saudis right here, based on my own observations and the cultural studies, and then some strategy ideas. So I would like for you to just note down for a minute, you know, you can write this little grid on your paper, and just take a couple of notes and then I'll, I'll give you my ideas and I'd like you to add your own as well. So since Saudis tend to be relationship oriented, your strategy could be to spend time getting to know them. So if you're trying to drum up some business with another company or trying to you know, make a connection, leave time after meetings to talk and you know, share coffee or meal together, tell them about yourself outside of the work and the project that you want to do together. Then, since Saudis tend to be flexible in their approach, which is one of the beautiful things about working with Saudis, what could your strategy be? Just be mentally prepared for changes, leave time in the schedule, go with the flow, and exercise patience. Since they tend to be non-confrontational, this means that they don't like fighting. I mean, in some cultures, it's pretty normal to have an argument. An argument is the way of doing business, right, sometimes. But um, this is not so appreciated, I would say. Um, and I would like to hear your thoughts on this as well. But since they tend to be non-confrontational, they preserve harmony, they dislike losing face, and they dislike causing others to lose face then give feedback diplomatically. So this is my suggestion, avoid saying negative things to people's faces and in front of a group. And also keep the solidarity in your team.
Okay. So since they prefer verbal communication and tend not to say no directly, what could our strategy be then? Maybe we could try our best to discuss things face to face. And if you don't get the information you're asking for, you can have a meeting with them or phone them. All right. How about the fact that they tend to look at the big picture in the beginning and focus on smaller details later? We could trust the process, agree on maybe general principles in the beginning, and then focus again on building the relationship. And then since they prefer to do things in groups or work together with others, the strategy could be try to work together with them and it makes the whole work day go smoother and easier. So I would like to ask if um, the facilitators, Dana and Esra, if you have any further comments you would like to mention about this slide, just any personal anecdotes or something to add to what was here. Hi, Cheryl, it's Isra. Hi, Isra. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Very good, thank you. I think I'm going to speak about my personal experience uh, regarding uh, the, you know, spending time getting to know them. Um, yes. uh, like the gentleman here was mentioning, it's good to spend some time before the meeting, yes. uh, which happened to me like a few times when I speak to them before we kind of break the ice. Uh, it's more of a casual discussion during the meeting and it actually mm -hmm. goes better. Uh, we are more comfortable at discussing the sensitive uh, points in the meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we just continue after the meeting for a coffee or a meal like you were mentioning. So it's a good, uh, it's a good way to meet before just to break the ice. And uh, definitely, definitely. This is really important for smoothing over relationships and making it easier to talk together. Thanks, Esra. Yeah. Actually, I'm a Liverpool fan, so I might be talking about the English league, yeah, to break the ice. <laughs> so to just talk about something that maybe we have in common and in common interest, yes. uh, it could be the food, football, Absolutely. Uh, anything, yeah, just break the ice. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. So what could be appropriate topics to discuss in business meetings, by the way? So you mentioned sports, you know, common sport teams. You could talk about travel. You could you know, talk about how wonderful Saudi Arabia is and the different places to visit and food. Food is always a good topic. All right, so moving on then. What about Saudi expectations in presentations? So generally speaking, they like rhetoric and eloquence. So rhetoric just means using persuasive ways of, of talking like persuasion techniques. And eloquence is important too. Eloquence meaning, you know, the way you express yourself is articulate and clear. They tend to like energy and enthusiasm in presentations. Please have a clean and professional appearance when you present. Qualifications and reputation are highly valued. And also the know-how. The know-how is, you know, how are you going to get from A to B? And then, of course, show respect and use the proper title. So educate yourself in advance and know if someone is called doctor or professor, and then use the title in addressing the person. You can use the personal touch, but be careful. And for this, I would like to ask Dana or Ezra, I think one of you might have a comment about this. Is Dana there? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Sorry, okay. I just uh, forgot my story. <laughs> I remember now. Um, so uh, we have a lot of uh, executives that come into the country and they're very good at uh, presentations and they use a lot of these uh, global uh, uh, best practices for presentations. And one is always, you know, starting with sharing a, a personal story or something about their family. And so there was an executive that had a picture of himself and his uh, daughters at their graduation. 
and uh, the daughters were wearing short skirts. And so, I mean, clearly, you know, that's fine. And it, but culturally over here, he was going to um, more of a smaller city, talking to a more conservative group. So, you know, we had to tactfully yeah. tell him, you know, it's great, share a story of your family, but maybe not this picture, maybe choose another picture. So, um, okay, that, that's, the, that's the story that I have to share about. That's this. a great story. That's a very I'm good example. The local culture. Very good example. Thank you, Dana, for that. Yes, it's important to educate yourself and know what is appropriate and what's not appropriate before giving your presentation. Thank you so much. What about meetings then? How are meetings? How do meetings tend to play out? Well, they tend to be extroverted and theatrical. This might be quite different from other cultures who are very reserved in their style at meetings. So if they raise their voice, just remember that it usually indicates sincerity or enthusiasm and not anger. In some cultures, loud voice is only used for anger, but just be aware that this is pretty normal in Saudi. I've noticed a lot of voice changes and also facial expression changes during meetings. Too much quietness on the part of the, you know, on your part might cause a little bit of worry. One-on-one -on -one meetings are not so common and listening is done better one-on-one. -on -one. And this is a comment that my Saudi friends often told me that it, the listening tends to be more effective if you meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. Trust your instinct and go with the process. So if you're not getting a clear yes or no right away, just go with the flow and, and wait for things to unfold in their own time. You can use flattery. Flattery means giving compliments, for example, about you know, the accomplishments of the company or the person's professional accomplishments. Use flattery, it's perfectly fine and also good eye contact. Are there any comments about this slide from the facilitators or anyone else? Would you like to add to this? name dropping and sharing um, knowledge about mutual contacts because what you find in Saudi still it's turned into a more modern society as opposed to traditional but still it seems more families are intermarried and everybody knows somebody else it's not like uh, you know um, you know uh, Jane Doe or something or John Doe in the States we're still pretty much anybody you touch base with you know the families from who who's his contact so it's good uh, to do that as well in a meeting for a couple of minutes, maybe. Very good. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is really true. If you have any common contacts, family members, friends, or, or even maybe colleagues that worked at the same places, it would be a good to, you know, just touch on that and talk about it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And now I have some negotiation tips. Now these negotiation tips come from Saudis. They are from my students. I used to teach the staff at KAUST and frequently I taught negotiation skills as part of my core courses. And we used to talk about like our best tips, you know, from time to time. And I used to tell them, you know, please lay out all your best tips. There were people that were involved in procurement, uh, finance, and they had to negotiate prices for buying materials for the university on a regular basis. And these are the tips that they gave me about negotiating in Saudi, from Saudis. Okay, so they tend to be skilled negotiators. So plan a strategy with your team and be ready. So just, I mean, this is basic for any negotiation, I think, you know, just make sure you have a strategy and you and your team are, are ready and you're all on the same page. Study the company, prepare very well. Good reputation and connections work wonders. So this is going back to the gentleman's comment from the previous slide about using your connections, working through, you know, just touching on people that you may know in common can really help the negotiation. Maybe you can get a local relationship manager who, who can help you also smooth things over if you're from outside Saudi. Um, try to show up to the meeting with a decision maker. You can also ask them to bring their decision maker to the meeting. So what happens often is that 
people show up to negotiations, but they're not the people who actually can make the decision. And, and there's a hierarchy. They have to take all the information back to their manager and then their manager has to ask their manager. And so it, 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 sometimes it's necessary. This is the way it is. But um, if possible, you can ask them to bring their decision maker. Um, and they just said, like, try not to allow the salesperson to, to talk too long or to show off too much. So I would like you to just, you know, turn to someone near you and discuss these tips. What do you think? I mean, have you observed this? Have you had similar experiences? I'll give you about one minute to discuss these tips. All right, so time's up for that one. And let's move on to some additional tips. We have negotiation tips number two, from Saudis to Saudis. Have a margin to offer a discount. This is one thing they, they warned is that they're always going to ask for a discount. So make sure you go in there with some flexibility in the prices you're asking. Often they're gonna say no first. <laughs> Now, obviously these are, you know, most of these come from people that have had a certain set of experiences and, you know, they reference their personal experience. It may not be the experience all the time, but just to give you some guidelines, you may have to take a hit in the beginning, recover later. In other words, you may have to discount your prices a lot just in the beginning to get the partnership. And then later you can, you know, as you build the relationship, you can start to recover and, and start to get back up to the level you, you want to ask. Make sure to show solidarity among your team. So in other words, you don't want to argue with people in your team in front of the other party. It may be seen as a weakness. Be sure to write down everything. Take copious notes during your meetings. Follow up, but if there's no response, be ready to pick up the phone and call them. All right. so. Now, turn to someone near you and discuss these tips. What do you think? Have you experienced this or was your experience different perhaps from these tips? So just take about one and a half minutes. You can talk about this slide and even the previous slide. I'll flash them back up here to remind you and just you know talk about it. What do you think? And the people who are online, if you wanna type in your um, situation, if you wanna type in your input in the chat, Feel free. Yes, okay. So I'm reading the chat window now and I'll share it with the Marriott participants. It often takes time to find out who the decision makers are. This is really true. Thank you, Shore. And that emails get little results. This is very true. Yes, it's important to call people or ask for a face-to-face -face meeting. All right. Let me just flash the previous slide so you can refer back to tips number one.
right? And back to tips number two. What do you think? Any more comments from the online participants? Sarah, we just had one comment from our Sure. Team. We said specifically about the negotiation tip number one. Okay. And I think that things have changed in the last 10 years. So whereas maybe a salesman or a saleswoman would be more keen to show off kind of in, uh, you know, maybe five or 10 years ago, perhaps today it's a little bit more westernized in the sales approach. Okay, so good. Keep in mind the time differences that as the society changes. Yes, a lot of things have changed in the last 10 years and also in the last five years, things have gotten very different. And as Saudi opens up more, a lot of foreigners are living there. A lot of people are, there's a lot more mixing of the techniques and the, the cultures are much more, let's say, used to each other when it comes to giving presentations and, and also making decisions together in groups. So, okay. Oh, there's another comment. Yes, please. Yeah, hi. hi. I, I think we can add here, we can add here the listening because it's very important during meetings. Yes. And we might miss so important details that helps to close the deal by missing those important notes from the client. So listening is very important as well. Okay, thank you for sharing that. That is really true. And that's why it's really important to always take copious notes and have someone who's catching all those small things that are coming out of the discussion. Thank you everyone for that input. So that brings us to the last task. It's a group task. So the Marriott participants, I'd like you to work with the people at your table. You can write your answers down on the paper there. The online participants will be placed in a breakout room and you can type your answers in the chat window. So this is the question. I would like you to think of a cross cultural miscommunication that you had in the past. Any, any time throughout your life when you were aware that, oh, I'm communicating with a completely different style than the person I'm talking to. And when you realize that you just didn't understand each other for some reason. And I'd like you to think of how you solved it. Like, how did you solve it? And what did you learn from the experience? So I'm going to give you about eight minutes and then be ready to share your answers after your discussion. All right, so go ahead and feel free to relax, discuss, and we'll see each other again in about eight minutes. The online people should be shortly placed into breakout rooms.
All right, everyone, time's up. All right. So I would like if one person from each group, we have to kind of be quick because we're almost at the end of the session time. Um, if you can just come up and share in one minute, one of the miscommunications you discussed in the table and what was learned as a result. All right. So may I have a brave person from each table who would like to go first? Or the facilitators can also help if they would like to speak on behalf of a table. Hi, my name is Afta. Hello, Afta. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to share a, a story that um, uh, I'm Indian by birth, but Canadian by citizenship. Okay. So we were working. We were working with the Chinese, and we used to send them mails, and the reply would always come back in English, very good. Mm -hmm. And we thought that this guy was speaking English, and now we have reached a time to do the communication. So we land in China, so we sit across the table, and he didn't speak a single Chinese, uh, sorry, English. And he never told us that he didn't speak English. <laughs> so we had to go and get a translator, and then we realized that he was so polite, he never said that he, he just welcomed us and never said that he didn't know a single Chinese. <laughs> sorry, English. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that story. That is a really good example of how we can be caught by surprise right through different cross-cultural situations thank you Afta. that was really nice story it's actually really common that um in that part of the world in far east asia they learn writing very very well and i know this from being a language teacher in korea for and japan for several years they usually learn written english very very well and they they have difficulties with spoken english I mean, not everyone, obviously, but many of them, yeah, it, it, it turns out that their writing is stronger than their speaking skills. Whereas I think in Saudi, it's the opposite. I think Saudis are very strong in speaking and maybe not as strong in writing skills. Again, it depends on the experience of each person. If they lived abroad, if they have a lot of experience with writing, of course, I, I met Saudis with wonderful English writing as well as spoken one. But um, yeah, this is really true how we can be caught by surprise by certain, you know, cross cultural um, interactions. Right. So, who's next? Who would like to come up and share one of your conundrums? Nicola. Hello, yeah, Nicola. Nicola. Um, I was saying that years ago I used to work for uh, Bechtel and I was doing IT training across Asia Pacific. And uh, often I would, um, I would train everyone and then nobody would actually put their hand up to ask a question because they don't want to lose face in front of people. So it was really difficult. It was like a one way training session. It wasn't interactive. Oh, sorry. It wasn't interactive. It was really difficult to, um, to get anything back from them and to understand if they were actually understanding what I was teaching. So yeah, that was tough. And then another situation I had was um, I used to work in Chile years ago as well, again for Bechtel. And um, I remember being in the lift one day and I was saying, oh, I'm really hot, it's so hot, I'm, I'm hot. And, uh, and the guy said, oh, you can't say that, you can't say that here in Chile. Uh, that's something we don't say in South, Af South America. It's, uh, you know, it's like I was saying I was sexy. Instead of, saying, <coughs> instead of talking about the temperature, I was talking about myself. So I just had to be aware culturally. There was a lot of <laughs> different thing, different ways to work with people, and you know, words get lost <laughs> in translation sometimes. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Nicola, for sharing those two stories. It's 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 great stories. It's great experiences you had that can really share and shed light on on cultural values. Um, just one comment, and I would like to ask the group. Um, a question about this. When you have the situation where people don't want to answer you and they don't want to lose face or they don't want to raise their hand in a group or they don't want to speak in front of others, what's the best way to get answers from people then if you really need them? Say something funny for them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's one technique. You can use humor because it relaxes people. 
And then what if it's a really important business decision? Does anybody know how you can get the answer that you really need? If nobody wants to speak up in front of a group, what situation may they speak up in? Sorry, I sorry, I realize you're you want to give your answer, but I'm now I I'm turning it into a group uh, question. Does anyone know where I'm going with this? Does But, but they might, um, they might, you might get the answer you need if you're one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, sorry for that. Please share your tables discussion. Yes. Uh, actually, it's not a miscommunication in, in language. What happened to us last year when the curfew started in Saudi. So I'm Ihab from UPS. So sorry, I did not introduce myself. Last year, when we started the virtual meetings, it was somehow new to everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being from a logistic company, we have the curfew and you have the e-commerce business was growing fast in the country. So we were in a meeting with the customer and he was so tense that he needs the quotation right now because they were shifting from B2B business module to B2C. So I need the quotation now because we have a board meeting. We need the pricing now. And just try to convince <coughs> him that we cannot do it like this. We need to understand more your business module and operation. So he was forcing us, no, no, I have half an hour. I need a quotation. If you cannot do it, we are stopping the meeting. So to calm him down and, you know, break the ice again with him and try to bring another people to the meeting to operation, for instance. So he started to understand that, yes, we cannot do it in that quick pace because he was so nervous at the beginning. Then he started to understand, yes, injecting people from operation will have the added value for him at the beginning, at the end. To have a good deal and have happy customers at the end. So it took us some time to calm him down. So that confrontation was very tense at the beginning, but we end up, as we say, in a happy ending. So it was a bit challenging for us, but uh, you know, showing that careness uh -huh. and positive attitude helped us to overcome the situation. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that very valuable lesson and example. That was great. Um, Absolutely. If you are having, if you're at a, like a standstill, you know, in a negotiation, show them you care. I love that. That, that is the best lesson we could, we could remember for our future negotiations. Just show the people that you care and usually they will calm down and, and go with the flow. Right. So who else, how many tables are there? Four, right? I can't see everyone very well. So we had, we heard from two. Okay, who, who would like to come up next? You heard from all of us, Cheryl. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought there, I couldn't see the whole room. All right, so thank you everyone. I think we're done then. I think, right, I think we've run out of time, unfortunately. I mean, this is a fantastic topic that we could discuss for, for, for hours and days and I would love to, you know, have more time to spend with you. So anyway, um, Thanks so much for coming. What I would like you to do, take a moment, take a piece of paper and write down these three things. Um, the online participants, you can write in the chat window, three things you learned, two things you're going to try or you're going to put in use right away, and one thing you'd like to learn more about. So if you can just take a minute and note that down. And actually what I'm going to do in the interest of time, I'm going to leave you to do this even during the um, you know, networking period, because I think we have to finish. So you can take your time and while you're having your coffee or your snack or you're talking to somebody, you can think about these three things. You can write them down. And then at some point before you leave, you can hand the paper to one of the moderators. All right, so three, two, one. Three things you learned, two things you're going to try, and one thing you'd like to learn more about. So for anyone who's interested in learning more, <clears throat> I just put a couple of books up here that I think are quite good for general cross-cultural knowledge and also 
some deep insights into Saudi culture and also Gulf Arab culture. So you can take a picture or write down these book names. Cheryl, there's some interest too from the group in um, okay. receiving some of this presentation afterwards. So okay, whatever you're sure. comfortable sharing it. it was yeah, fun. that would be just Thank fine. You. Sure, yeah. and that way you don't have to scramble to write it down. We can share it after that. Definitely. Okay. So in that case, I would like to say thank you so much to everyone whoops, for their participation. And, um, you know, shukran jazilan to everyone. It was a pleasure learning from you because I always, you know, learn something from the, the groups and culture is one of the best topics to talk about and to learn about. So learning is lifelong and uh, we should always keep learning as much as we can about culture. And, uh, and communication in order to you know, improve our business relationships. And I wish you all the best, whatever you're doing in Saudi Arabia, if you're you know, starting your own company or you started your own company already, or if you're working for an employer in Saudi, or if you're Saudi and you're working with expats, whatever your situation is, I wish you the best of luck. Um, you, you can feel free to stay in touch with me and masalama to everybody. Thank you, Cheryl. That was fantastic. I know I speak for everyone here in person and, and also the, our virtual participants as well. So thank you so much for leading us through this valuable discussion. Thank you again to all of you who joined. And I uh, want to say a special thanks to ExxonMobil and UPS for sponsoring this and, and being our partners here. So it's a delight to have you guys with us. Congratulations on joining our first hybrid event, and we hope there'll be many more to come. So thank you, and, and please stick around, continue these conversations. We have plenty of food and, and coffee and tea, and um, yeah, just a delight, delight to be with you all. Thank you so much.